Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today we will be discussing the disaster of the Sea Wing, an 1800s excursion vessel that met a horrific end, resulting in one of the worst maritime disasters on the upper Mississippi River. If you'd like to hear more about this ship's tragic story, stay tuned. Quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised for those under the age of 13. Please keep in mind that I'm not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I've done my research. Okay everyone, let's get into it. The Sea Wing was first built as a stern wheel paddle towboat being built at Diamond Bluff, Wisconsin sometime in 1888 for the Diamond Joe line. In imperial measurements, she was 135 feet long, had a beam of 16 feet wide, a height of 22 feet up to the pilot house, and a draft of 4.5 feet deep, displacing 110 long tons. In metric measurements, she was 41 meters long, had a beam of 4.9 meters wide, a height of 6.7 meters up to the pilot house, and a draft of 1.4 meters deep, displacing 110 tons. She was powered by two six-piston steam engines that were 10 inches or 25.4 centimeters in diameter and a 6 foot or 1.83 meter stroke. As for capacity, she was rated for a maximum of 350 passengers while towing two passenger barges. As for safety precautions, we know that she had 175 wood floats, six axes, 175 cork and tube life preservers, and seven lifeboats with 28 oars split between them, or four oars per boat. There isn't much research available on her service history. We do know that Captain David Niles Weathern typically used the vessel to tow log rafts to lumber mills along the Mississippi River in the United States. As a side job, he would operate his vessel as a no-frills excursion vessel. Other than this, we don't know what the ship was up to from the time she was launched in 1888 until 1890 when disaster struck. We're going to set everything up before we really dive into the disaster. There's a couple of extenuating circumstances that are going into the Sea Wing disaster that we need to know first. First of all, though Captain Weathern based his steamboat in Diamond Bluff on the Wisconsin side of the Mississippi River, there was great interest in his excursion cruises among the townspeople located in Red Wing, Minnesota, which was the largest city along his proposed route in July of 1890 for a Sunday day-long voyage to Lake City, located on Lake Pepin, roughly 60 miles from St. Paul, Minnesota. This voyage was to go down to a carnival-like event down at a military encampment down in Lake City, with residents there excitedly awaiting the steamboat's arrival with popcorn, ice cream, and lemonade stands ready. The 1st Regiment of the Minnesota National Guard was hosting this event at Camp Lakeview. This was to be the social event of the season, with the weather hot and humid. That can be great weather, but it can also spell disaster in terms of weather, and that day in the Twin Cities area, there would be tornadoes in the evening that possibly caused the Sea Wing disaster. Now that we are set up, we can get into the voyage. On July 13, 1890, Sea Wing left Diamond Bluff at 7.30 a.m., towing the covered barge the Jim Grant and heading down to Trenton, Wisconsin by 8.30 a.m., then heading toward Red Wing. The ship pulled up to the levee in Red Wing around 9.30 a.m. to a crowd of excited residents. More than 150 customers boarded Sea Wing as well as the Jim Grant that was attached to her, ready for the trip down to Lake City. The Jim Grant would actually carry a number of the day's passengers. The ship did make it to the celebration in Lake City, with passengers dancing to a four-string band on the Jim Grant attached to the Sea Wing's port side as they floated down the river. Captain Weathern's family was also aboard, enjoying the fanfare as they headed down to Frontenac, Minnesota, before heading to Lake City, arriving there at 11.30 a.m. The passengers would disembark, visiting the troops, picnicking, and enjoying a band concert later in the day. The day was hot, humid, and a ton of fun. It was originally scheduled to end with the ship leaving between 5 and 6 p.m. to head back to Diamond Bluff. 
However, this would be delayed until after 7 p.m. because the National Guard had scheduled a dress parade for the visitors, and Captain Weathern agreed to delay after a number of passengers asked him to. A dress parade, or military parade, is a formation of soldiers whose movement is restricted by close order maneuvering called drilling or marching. Typically, these are held on major holidays and during military events around the world. The passengers of Sea Wing and the rest of Lake Cityans began to enjoy the parade around 5 or 6 p.m., when the weather conditions would begin to look ominous. Captain Weathern had a sour feeling in the pit of his stomach, and he sounded the ship's whistle, calling all passengers back to the ship and barge to leave. By 8 p.m., every passenger was back on board and the ship readied to leave. The weather was souring, and rivermen advised Captain Weathern to delay his departure because they could feel in the air that a storm was on its way. However, Captain Weathern thought the weather was starting to clear up, and the Sea Wing would leave, making its first stop at Lake City's actual port since she'd spent the day at Camp Lakeview nearby. Roughly 30 minutes into her return voyage, Captain Weathern's blood surely went cold as he noticed a gale heading toward them from the Minnesota shore. If you don't know, a gale is a strong wind. You might have heard the phrase gale forced winds before, and it comes from this nautical term. Captain Weathern turned the sea wing to meet the storm head on, but a large wave struck the steamboat and tilted it immediately to a 45 degree angle. If this wasn't bad enough, while the ship was listing, she was struck by another gale that capsized the vessel. Sadly, the passengers made a mistake that seems dubious to us, but is understandable for their level of knowledge and their desperation for security. They retreated to the ship's passenger cabin for protection after this wave tilted the ship, and when that gale flipped it over, they were trapped in the upside-down ship and most of them drowned. Of the roughly 150 passengers on board, 98 would die as they were thrown around like ragdolls or submerged with no way out. There were 57 women on board, all dressed in their Sunday best, and unfortunately these heavy dresses weighed them down and made swimming almost impossible. To add to this, it was uncommon for people at this time to know how to swim, only worsening a bad situation. Of these 57 women, 50 would die. There were whole families that died on the Sea Wing, and families were broken. Many of the victims were teenagers or in their early 20s. Some were couples, newlyweds, or just dazed from starting their marital bliss. Children and toddlers were killed as well, their lives ending before it even began. Red Wing would bear the brunt of the lives lost, with 77 of the 98 lost hailing from Red Wing. After the disaster, bodies were recovered and identified, with families holding their breath and praying their family members were missing and still alive rather than dead. Red Wing would be plagued with round after round of funerals, wakes, and celebrations of life, a town clad in black. It's been given a nickname that, though it is understandable, still makes me groan. It's been called Minnesota's Titanic. Again, dear listeners, I am calling you to action. Stop comparing tragedies in any sense, including shipping disasters. It lessens the severity of both, and we should remember all of the victims for the tragedy they endured. Though this disaster would devastate Red Wing, Minnesota, and is still well known there to this day, across the U.S., it is widely forgotten. Please take a moment out of your day today to remember the victims who perished in this tragedy. As for the aftermath, there's been some conflicting reports, so just be aware of that as we move forward. The first of the conflicting reports regards Captain Weathern, with some stating that he'd been arrested for his own protection. There were accusations thrown around that the ship was overloaded and headed out despite objections that the weather conditions were not safe, as well as some stating that he'd been inebriated during the voyage and therefore incapable of making safe decisions. Remember how I told you passengers gathered in the passenger cabin for safety? Well, accusations were levied against Captain Weathern's that he'd forced women and children from the barge, the Jim Grant, to the cabin where he would lock up all of the women and children, and this supposedly explained why only seven women survived. It has been reported that many of the women had actually left the Jim Grant of their own volition because of objectionable conduct by other passengers. There would be an inquiry into the sinking to figure out what happened to the Sea Wing. The investigation was led by John D. Sloan, who held the office of Inspector of Steam Vessels at that time, and he'd be assisted by multiple captains of other vessels, including Captain Charles F. Yeager and Captain George B. Knapp. 
These two captains were the inspectors from the Galena, Illinois board, as well as two captains from the Duluth, Minnesota board, Captain Michael F. Chalk and Captain John Monaghan, who would also take affidavits from the survivors of the accident. An affidavit, for those who don't know this legal term, is a written statement confirmed by oath or affirmation for used as evidence in court toward a singular side in a dispute or to affirm a claim that someone is making. What I'm about to tell you is going to make your jaw drop. The former captain of the Sea Wing, Captain H.C. Fuller, had been licensed for excursion trips of up to 175 passengers. However, this license was not transferred over to Captain Weathern. So, by regulation, he was only allowed to legally carry 12 passengers and he was not allowed to take barges in tow at the time of the accident. During questioning, Captain Weathern stated that he wasn't aware that under the ship's current excursion permit, he was legally required to have an additional pilot on board, and he didn't know the number of required crew needed for manning and handling all of the lifeboats. To add some real icing to the cake, he also admitted that the life preservers on board were in a, quote, miserably deficient condition. This changes how we see the sinking entirely. This was a man totally underprepared, unregulated, and sadly ignorant to the necessary changes he needed for this voyage to be safe. After the inquiry, it was reported on August 11, 1890, that Captain Weathern's license to master and pilot a vessel was suspended due to unskillfulness in his manning of the sea wing. In the report, other reasons were listed for the suspension, and these were that on the day of the accident, the ship's passenger capacity was indeed exceeded by 30 people. The passenger list was incorrect, and the voyage should not have been started in a storm, and had it been, the ship should have hugged the shoreline instead of heading out into the middle of the lake. There was a recommendation for criminal charges to be pressed against Captain Weathern by the United States District Attorney in the report, though charges were never filed against him. As for the wreckage, there are reports from August of 1890 that state the wreck of the Sea Wing was raised by the crew of another steamship, the Edward S. Durant Jr., with the engines and barge being recovered completely. They'd be purchased by the former owner of the Sea Wing. The boilers were not recovered at that time. The Sea Wing would be rebuilt with the original pieces that were recovered, and she'd remain in service until her scrapping quite some time later on. All in all, 98 people died in this devastating catastrophe, and that is what we need to remember. It is important to keep their story alive so that we will never repeat the mistakes of the past. Nowadays, inspections and regulations are readily enforced, so this type of mistake is rare. However, captains can still be complacent and need to be held accountable when they are. If you want to hear another story like that, check out our video on Costa Concordia. Thanks so much to our lovely patrons for subscribing and supporting the channel and myself as a creator. You guys are awesome and it really does help us out. If you'd like to support this channel and future episodes, go to patreon.com slash shipwreck Sunday to join. Thank you for tuning into Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a 5-star review as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and interact with us, and we're also on Facebook and Instagram. Tune in next Sunday for the story of M.V. Doña Paz, the deadliest peacetime maritime disaster in history. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.